Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Again, I know it was quite short notice, but I'm very pleased we got so many people in here, even when would we have just about a week. Um, so my talk is going to be on symbolic music analysis for music transcription. So this is sort of looking at specifically music language models and how we might use those to help improve transcription. And this is ongoing work, this is part of my current thesis. Um, so, so, transcription, what is music transcription? You saw a very similar slide in the previous talk. Um, but just to reiterate, it's going from some sort of audio signal. And I think the end goal is really going to some human readable notation, like a score notation. But again, you have to go through some intermediate stage. This is MIDI, this is a piano roll notation of MIDI. Um, but to be useful for humans, we really want sort of this idea, which is something that Emmanuel uh, is going with his upcoming work in the beat tracking area. Um, so what's the motivation behind using music language model? Uh, like I said, most of the work is on the first stage, note detection, multi-F0 tracking. And these are results from the Myrex multi-F0 tracking shared task. Uh, and you can see in the past seven years, there's been little improvement. Now, these models are improving, but there's just, a the human transcriptionist is so far ahead of what we have currently. That's very important. and. Uh, that we can try and try some new methods, add on some extra things to our existing transcription methods. Um, and I argue we should look at speech transcription. Speech transcription, you can't do speech transcription without a language model. It wouldn't work. So if we try to apply that to music, I think we'll get a very nice improvement. And that brings me to sort of the research question that I'm looking at. Uh, this is a bit of a broad claim, I guess this gets into cognitive science and philosophy almost, but can we teach computers to understand music? And I like to think that we can. Now, I have a specific definition of understand, so we'll, we'll sort of put that off for another day, but I think we can, and I think I'll try and show in this talk that we can. Going back to this picture, what exactly does that mean? Where would that be applied, and how would that help in transcription? So the idea would be to, to get the computer some idea of what to expect at this stage. So tell the computer, this is what music looks like. This is sort of, this is what are typical things to hear in music, and based on that, apply that to this stage. Apply that to the note detection stage. So based on what you're hearing and what you've heard already, have this model of what to expect and use that when you're trying to transcribe the notes. So with that in mind, I have my proposed model, which is my PhD thesis. Uh, it's really symbolic music data that I'm looking at. Symbolic data meaning either MIDI transcription or score notation. Uh, this is a model, as I'm designing it, I want it to be incremental. So I want it to be able to run from beginning to end if, of a single piece and not have to sort of look forward in the piece, look ahead and look back and correct your transcription. And there's two reasons for this. One, it's sort of, it's a bit of a cognitive claim, I guess. So as humans, you're able to do this. If you're listening to a piano song, as you're listening to it, you can sort of hear, you can track the beat. You can, so at least a trained musician can track the beat, can hear the time signature as it goes, can follow the chord progression as it goes. There's no need to look ahead to the end of the song in order to interpret what you hear at the beginning of the song. And I want that in this model. Another advantage of this is that it could be sort of run in real time. So it could be run on a stream of data, it, almost a live performance, if you think, 
where you are transcribing as you go along, so you don't have to wait until the end of the entire performance in order to go back and start transcribing at the beginning. Um, so how my model is composed, it'll have a few different phases. And the idea is, since I want it to be incremental, I'm modeling all these phases jointly. So the first step in the model is voice separation, followed by some metrical structure analysis, and then things that I'll be working on in the future. This is really what the talk is about, the model itself. Um, but it's not that I do voice separation all the way through, and then uh, metrical structure analysis all the way through, and then anything else. It's I'm modeling each one in line instead of incremental. So, to start, voice separation. First off, what exactly does that mean? I don't mean specifically voices. This could be instruments as well. What we see here is a piano roll notation. This is one of the Bach fugues. And in this data, you can see the voices. Voice means sort of a contiguous part in the music, a, a stream of notes that go together. So the voices here have been color coded. Now, if you were just to give this picture to a human without the colors, it would be a bit difficult. See if you could imagine there's no colors and see if you can figure out sort of the context of this piece. See if you can find the time signature, the beat. It's a bit tricky. But once we see the notes, we say, okay, so here's the, here's the soprano part, here's the highest part, there's treble uh, time bass, and you can sort of follow along. You can almost hear the piece now that you get, are able to separate it out and think about each part differently. So in the same way that this would help a human understand a piece of music, uh, it makes it much easier for computers. Like Emmanuel was saying, um, modeling a polyphonic stream of notes is quite difficult. But for monophonic, once you get a good single voice going, you can sort of model what to expect in the future. Um, so that builds into the second point, monophonic. I, I constrain the voices here to be monophonic, and that helps with computation in future stages. Um, there are cognitive claims that, you know, if you hear a chord that's just played in the bass part, for example, octaves, really this is heard as a single voice. But I am not allowing that in my model. It's something that maybe, you know, to look at in the future, that's definitely room for improvement, but that's something that's not in there yet. Another important thing is that this will work. Now, understand that this is symbolic data. It's not acoustic recordings, but you can have live performance symbolic data. So an important thing about this model is that it works on live performance. It doesn't require already quantized pieces, computer generated straight from the score. Uh, some methods that do work on, that don't work on live performance, sort of take live performance and cut off some of the notes, quantize the pieces, it gets a bit messy. So this model doesn't require that. Um, and talking about live music, right? Uh, is that even really important? Could you just quantize? Is, is that a big deal? Uh, so this is the gap length. These are, this is a, from a corpus of the Bach fugues played live, symbolic data. Um, and this is the gap length between consecutive notes in a single voice model, this is a percentage of the first note's length. And this is the gap length. So you see, usually, the performer will play the note, one following another, plus or minus 5%. Falls into that bucket. But there's almost this normal looking distribution here, where most commonly, there is a decent amount of overlap. Almost 20% of the previous note's length is overlapped by uh, successive notes. And so you see there is this overlap here. And even, I mean, there are a few with more than half of the note is, is totally overlapped. Uh, and this happens when a performer is maybe playing a trill. All of the notes almost overlap entirely. Uh, so this gets pretty messy. Uh, so for the voice separation, uh, I should say this is work that we published in the Journal of New Music Research at the beginning of the year. 
uh, me and Mark, my advisor. Um, so what do we base this model on? Well, there's David Huron and Tamoxico, uh, two separate papers in 2001 and 2008. They have these rules for what constitutes voice leading and what to expect in a voice. Uh, the general idea behind these, behind these rules is that within a voice, there will not be very many uh, large differences in pitch between consecutive notes, and there will not be very many long gaps in time between consecutive notes. Uh, so we try to model that in, in our model here. And part crossing and part overlaps, if you have two separate voices, so the different colors in the chart I showed earlier, they don't, if, if one is below the other, they don't tend to sort of cross and stay like this. They'll, they'll usually stay in the same way. So, two works uh, that we saw to sort of base ours off of, or to, to continue to work forward from, uh, was first this work by Chu and Wu in 2005, uh, and that's what this picture is here. Um, and what they did is they looked at contigs. So they separate out each song into periods of time where there's only the same number of notes present throughout that entire period. So here you have, uh, in the middle, four voices present, always. So four notes at the same time everywhere within this contig. And then at this point the bass voice drops out and if you're going backwards, the top two voices drop out. And what they do is they divide this within each contig. They argue that it's pretty simple to draw the voices together. You just keep the notes in order, and you assume nothing crosses. Uh, and then deciding which, which voice to, to tie in with preceding and the following voices is just to minimize the distance. They do a, sort of a global search at each of these joints to figure out how to tie them together. Um, one downside of that is, of their method, is that it doesn't work on live performance. So they need a very clean idea of, of these contigs. If you have any parts where, you know, maybe this voice drops out for a little bit, then it gets messy, you have another to take in there, and then things get a bit tricky. Uh, another method was by Dwayne and Pardo in 2009, um, and they did sort of a graph search. So they have a similar idea to these contigs, but by note. So they tie each note together vertically, of notes that occur at the same time, and they uh, use a graph search. They fully connect each node from, from each chord to every node in the one past it, and just do an exhaustive graph search across. Um, now, these are incremental, so they're, they're all starting from, so for example, Chu and Wu, they start from the place where there's the most voices present. So they have to finish the song, and then look back through it, find wherever the most voices are present, and work outwards from there. Uh, so what's our idea? It's uh, uh, just an HMM-based model, uh, based on two main ideas which are pitch gap and temporal gap. And these are tied back into the Huron's things that we talked about earlier. Uh, we model, model both of those with a simple Gaussian. Uh, and we take these, this Gaussian distribution, we just learned it from the data, with two additional constraints. One, when two voices cross, as I said, this is usually uncommon those transition probabilities are divided in half. So we give them a penalty for voices crossing. And another idea where new voices are assigned quite a low probability. This, is, this probability here is also set from training uh, with the idea that we don't want to just keep adding new voices. We don't want to have you know, 20 voices present when there's only four notes at a time. Um, so we assign new voices some low probability so it tends to try and group notes into a minimal voice as possible. It doesn't always do that, but we don't always want that. So, uh, I don't want to get into really too much of the details, the nitty-gritty details, but I'll go through a simple example 
Say we're doing voice separation here on this song. It's a very interesting song. It has five notes. Uh, two voices here. There's a red voice and a blue voice. So state zero. Empty state. Haven't seen any notes yet. State one. We're going through. We see the first note. There's no choice here. This is an easy choice. We simply add a new voice and add the note to it. The voices are notated by the braces there. We're going through incrementally again, left to right. We see the second note and add it to a new voice. Again, no choice here. There's so much of an overlap, so much of an overlap between these two notes. Our model says this is not possible. We have a maximum overlap that we allow assuming the parameters are set decently well, this won't happen. Finally, when we see the third note, that's this long red note, there's a choice. We don't know whether to add it into the red voice, which we do here, or into the blue voice, which we do here. Now, our model currently, this is its top choice. This is its top hypothesis. Currently, it's incorrect, you can see because this pitch distance is smaller than, than the one in the red note. So at this point, the model thinks it's more likely that that red note is assigned to the blue voice. And it fixes itself when it sees the next note. It sees this blue note. And if these two were together in a voice, as it was uh, here, this blue note would have to go in the red voice. And then you have a cross. And that's something that we're trying to avoid. So it, this, this transition probability is low, therefore, please swap. And now, our top choice for the hypothesis is correct. Finally, we see the fifth note, and we simply, the only choice, this overlaps too much with the blue note to be in the same voice, so we simply add it to whichever voice had the last red note. And you can see in this case, uh, we get the answer correct. Now, most of the songs are a bit trickier than that to do, but that's the idea. Um, going into the results, first comparing against Chu and Wu's work, this is uh, average voice consistency. This is a metric that they came up with and used for their model. So we use that to compare against them. Um, we have three data sets. Remember, theirs doesn't work on live data. So these are all computer-generated, computer-aligned MIDI files. Uh, for the inventions, they're quite simple. There are only two parts in each, two voices. We don't tell the model that, but they're quite simple pieces. The symphonias usually have three, so you can see it drops a bit. And the fugues are quite complicated. They can get four or more voices. Um, so as you see, there's hardly any room for improvement on the inventions. In fact, not significant improvement. Again, not significant improvement on the symphonias, but on the fugues, we do see a good improvement, significant. And again, overall, this improvement is significant. So, one example of a case where our model is able to do better than theirs. Uh, this is invention 15. This is the beginning, the first bar. Um, and what's happening here is you have eighth notes in the bass voice and the blue voice. And in the soprano voice, the top voice, you had a nice note. And if you remember from Chu and Wu's work, their first step is to divide the song into contigs, into periods of the song where there are the same number of notes happening at once. One of those contigs is here, the entire beat one, which includes the bass note and the first two notes from the melody. And their constraint is that within a contig, all the notes are, especially if it's just one voice, all of the notes are tied together in voices. So they will always tie this note to that note. No other choice. Meanwhile, our model is able to figure out, hmm, well, this note makes a lot of sense to be tied here. Therefore, let's move that to a new voice, and it fits in correct. Comparing now to Duane and Bardot's work, this is a, an F1 score. Um, you can see from here up, these are the uh, computer-generated MIDI pieces, not the live data. 
and you can see we get good improvement, and in fact, significant improvement on the Symphonias and the Fuse. The Haydn, these are string quartets, and we don't get significant improvement, actually, it's quite similar performance. Um, the reasoning there is these are pretty complicated pieces, and especially in the string quartets, violin one and violin two tend to be playing quite close to the same register, and they're crossing back and forth a bit. And this is something that a model had a hard time with. If you had maybe a deeper understanding of the voice, that we would be able to figure that out. But uh, getting back to the Bach fugues and the inventions in the fugues, these are the live performances. So art does pretty well, even on live performances, almost as good as it does on the computer generated performances. A couple of examples. Uh, this first one is Bach fugue number one from the first book. And here we have four voices. You can see they're a bit more complicated. This yellow note here should be tied to this yellow note here. This is the same voice. Duane and Pardo's <coughs> program doesn't do that. It actually ties here. That's it to the green voice. This one drops out at the same time. It's a bit tricky. While our model is able to get this correct. So there's an example of one improvement. And how about where we get this wrong? Both of ours get this wrong. This is Fugue 17 from Book 2, right at the beginning, the eighth bar. Uh, you can see this voice, the blue voice, begins right as the red voice ends. And that is a problem. So what our model does, it says, hmm, I don't want to add a new voice right now. What I'll do is I'll just shift the voices down. I'll tie this green note to the yellow note, the yellow note to the blue note, the red note down to the green note, which is Correct. Now, how can we improve that? We need to give this model some idea of the musical context of the tip. Look for patterns, look for rhythms. So, in a few, every time a new voice begins, it starts with the same pattern. So, given that you see this, it's quite likely that maybe it's a new voice. Or, this green voice. It's been playing 16th notes for a while. It's been playing them for a long time. So, it's quite likely that maybe it'll just keep playing 16 drums. This looks like a nice voice, maybe you should do that. But in order to do that, you need some idea of the metrical structure. You need to have some sort of metrical structure analysis built into this voice separation model. Or perhaps model jointly, which is the next portion of the talk. This is ongoing work, so it's, it's sort of in its well, we can see. <laughs> so metrical structure analysis is trying to find the tree structure of a given piece. This is an example of a metrical structure. This is a 3-4 bar. You see three quarter notes in each bar. Um, and there are three variables that are involved here. There's what is the structure of the tree. 3-4, uh, you can first go into three beats, and then each beat is divided into two. You have the phase, which is where is this bar aligned in the piece? Every piece has many bars. We assign one tree per bar. So where is the beginning of the first bar so we know where to place the rest of them? And then there's the tactus length, which is what is the length of the eighth note here? Um, so for example, you could have 3-8, in which this would be a quarter note, eighth note, and sixteenth note. And our goals with this model, we wanted to keep our assumptions down. We want to have very few assumptions so that it, we can sort of generalize it to different types of music. Currently, one of the drawbacks is that it doesn't yet work with live performance. And that's something that I want to do. Uh, and I'll talk about that at the end, but currently all of this work has been done on computer-generated beat aligned music. So, the first thing we tried was a grammar. There's a PCFG, probabilistic, uh, context-free grammar where it's quite simple. So we set this manually, but we learn all the probabilities from the data. And the idea is quite simple. Uh, for every measure, it goes into a certain number of beats. And every beat goes into a certain number of subbeats. And every subbeat has, or beat has, R is a symbol for just some rhythm. 
So either single note, arrest, combination. So this is the metrical structure of a 6 8 bar, which has a dotted quarter note followed by 3 8 notes. Um, and important, one of the things we were saying, we didn't want to make too many assumptions. So we condition each probability on the measure type. And that includes the important note here is this first transition. So for any measure structure, we give the probability of that measure uh, for any start symbol, we give the probability of any measure structure essentially one. So we don't, for example, in our training corpora, there were many more songs in 4-4 than there were in 2-4. We don't want to make any assumption about that. We model each one evenly. But one of the problems with the PCFG is there's this assumption of independence. So there's this idea that what happens at this beat isn't related to what happens over here. And in music, this is not correct, especially at the level of just a single bar. What we know is that in a 6-8 bar, the first beat is probably going to be stressed. You're going to hear some accent there. And you can see here that's the case. But if this dotted quarter note is followed by another one, you wouldn't hear that stress. This note is only heard as stressed because it's long in relation to what comes after. And that's very important. That's something that PCFGs miss entirely. And that's what we hope to model with lexicalization. Uh, lexicalize PCFG, LPCFG. So we have the same tree here with a few spaces. The first step is to add heads to every note. And a head is two numbers, which has a note length and a note offset. And that is the note which is deemed most important to that note, which is, this is one other assumption we've made, is that important notes will be longer, the long notes are heard as stress, and they will fall closer to the beginning of that note. So, uh, these numbers are measured in relation to the length of the note itself. So, let's start with this note. This subbeat has one note beneath it, which uh, its length is the entire note, so note length will be one, Note onset will be zero because that note starts exactly at the beginning of the note. So one zero. Likewise here and here, same thing. And likewise at this beat. Again, we're looking at lengths in relation to the note itself. Now what happens at this beat? The most important note we said, remember first, is whichever note is longest. These three notes are the same length. Ties are broken by whichever note occurs first. So we say that this note is the most important note under this. The length of this note in relation to this note is one third. And the onset location is again at the start of the note. So one third and zero. If we were to be referring to this note, this would be one third and one third, since it starts a third of the way through the note. Carrying up to the top of the tree, we have the most important note here, one half length and zero onset. It starts at the beginning of the note, likewise at the start. The final step is to add strengths based on the siblings' heads. So at each node down here, we compare the heads of uh, a node and its siblings. Here, these heads are all equal. Therefore, we say that their strength is even. We also have strong and weak. So at the beat level, we see that this head is stronger than this head. And this is the idea of context. We say that this note is longer than whatever is the important note over here. So this will be a strong beat. We'll hear that as stress. And we assign them the strengths of strong and weak. We only carry this out at the levels of subbeat and beat. And we're using standard LPCFG probabilities uh, with the additional configure, uh, uh, conditioning on the measure type again. Uh, so how do we actually model this? We start many hypotheses simultaneously. Um, each one has three latent variables, which is, like I said earlier, the tree structure, the phase, and the tactus length. And one current drawback 
Hypotheses cannot change structure, phase, or tactus length throughout the piece. No type signature changes a lot in your songs. So maybe stick with Bob or something. Uh, so how do we evaluate this? Our evaluation metric is similar to one proposed by Roger Dannenberg, um, but his is a combined beat tracking and type signature metric. Idea, the idea is we want some sort of F1 metric, and we want it to be based on the different levels of the tree. So say the correct time signature is 4-4 four, four at the top, and we guess 2-4. So at the bottom level, assuming the phase is correct, <coughs> the tactus length is correct, at the bottom level we have this eighth note, and you can see in the gold standard tree, the eighth note is there. So that's a true positive. Same case up here in the quarter note, we have that, and that's in the correct tree. But at the top level, what do we have? This is a half note. This is a whole note. It's not correct. But is it incorrect? Not necessarily. If you, you can imagine putting two of these trees next to each other, tying the half notes up into the super bar level, we we'll call it, and then you get essentially the 4-4 four, four tree. So we cannot mark this as incorrect, but we do give it a false negative. So we haven't guessed the 4. So in this case, two true positives, no false positives, one false negative, which gives the precision recall F1 score is shown there. Say we get 6A. Again, the bottom level is correct, true positive. Here, the beat level is totally incorrect. You have no chance to align this node with any node in here. This takes up one and a half of those. Cannot be aligned. And again, at the top level, this takes up three quarters of that top node. We can't align that. So these levels are incorrect. These are false positives. And that gives us precision, recall, F1 scores, all of one third. And this is exactly what we want to see. If the answer is 4-4, four, 2-4 four, four is pretty good. Not far off. 6-8 is not very good at all. So, the results. Uh, we compare ourselves to two other models. So this is the LPCFG that we talked about. This is the simple PCFG without the lexicalization. That's with the assumption of independence. And then the baseline method is this 4-4 method. Essentially, we guess that every song is in 4-4 time, which is the most common, and that the first bar begins at the beginning of the first note. And that actually does pretty well, especially in the inventions. They're quite simple. Um, but what you see in the fuse, we get a really nice improvement between the 4-4. It looks like the PCFG is actually learning something. It's, doing, it's getting a decent improvement. What's really nice is what we gain with the lexicalization, with this uh, dependence that we're modeling. And that's a very good improvement there. It would be nice if we saw that also on the inventions. We do get an improvement, but uh, it's almost uh, one-tenth of what we see in the fuse. And the reason for that, I think, is training data. But let's look into it a bit more. So here's a chart. Uh, for the fuse and for the inventions, for each of our different models, how many songs we get entirely correct with three true positives, mostly correct, two true positives, almost incorrect, and then entirely incorrect in the light loop. So again, the fuse, this is what we want to see. We're getting improvements in every category. We're getting a uh, nice improvement on the number we get entirely correct. Clearly, it's learning something. On the inventions, not as much. You can see uh, the 4-4 baseline gets actually a lot of the pieces right for free, essentially. The inventions are quite simple. Um, what the lexicalization does do is eliminate those that we get entirely incorrect, which is good. And we do see an improvement from the PCFG, at least on the three true positive level. But there's a little decrease there. So why is that? Why might that be? What we've done for each of these methods, we have trained with leave one out cross-validation. So we have trained the inventions, each invention on the other 14 inventions. We trained each of the fugues on the other 47 fugues. 
So there's more training data with the fuse. So could it be that with more training data, we improve performance? Makes sense. But let's look at it. So remember, we're conditioning every branch in, in our grammar on the measure type. So if there are only, for example, four pieces in six out of the fuse, which is the case, that means for each one of those, we only have three other pieces to train on, which is not enough. And the performance shows it. But then once we get up to songs that are in three, again, it's still not very good. You notice these numbers don't quite add up. It's because I've left out nine and 12, which had only one, I think, song. Um, but once you get up to four, four time, or four, eight time, or four, whatever time, uh, there are a lot of pieces to train on. Even with just 25 pieces to train on, we get F1 of almost 0.9, which is really good. Uh, and we don't see that in the inventions. Actually, we do see, so there is this improvement there, but we just don't have that many songs to train on. The inventions are quite simple. simple. Um, so modeling them with the complex rhythms of the fugues doesn't quite work out. We need more songs in the style of the inventions. Um, so, looking at one place that gets it right and one place that gets it wrong, this is Fugue 1, Bach 1, uh, Fugue 1 from Book 1. Obviously, there's a lot of this song to go. I'm just showing you the first two bars to give you an idea of what the piece is. Um, but here we guess 4-4 four, four time, and we guess with the correct phase and the correct tactus length. Uh, and what the model learns, at least for these first two bars, here it sees, okay, we've just started. We have a weak beat with just an eighth note. Weak beat here, strong beat. This is the longest note of the measure, so it marks this beat as strong. And then in bar two, in this voice, and again, we have a strong beat followed by three weak beats here. And in 4-4 four, four time, you very often see a stress on one and on three. And it's able to model that, and it learns that and it gets it correct. Now, there's a lot of things that come after that that sort of help with this as well. One place that it gets it wrong, almost surprisingly so, uh, is this piece, Fugue 15 from Book 1. Here's bar 1. This pattern here occurs all throughout this piece. It happens over and over and over again. This pattern here is quite, you would see that pattern and you'd say, okay, yeah, that's 6-8. Of course that's 6-8. This is a very common uh, pattern in 6-8 time. But we guess 4-4. Four, four. What happened there? So the problem is, this probability, so the probability that, so here we have two beats, which are even. We have the same pattern in each, so they're even. The probability of an even beat going to strong, weak, weak, which is what we have in the subbeats, strong, weak, weak, strong, weak, weak, is very low in the data, which shouldn't be the case. This should be a pattern that we see all over the place. It just so happens that in the fuse, since we only have three other songs to train off of, we haven't seen this before, or it's very unlikely to occur throughout the rest of the fuse. Uh, so, assuming we get more training data, there should be some with a similar rhythm to this. So we should be able to improve that. So future work. Um, one idea would be to do back-off probabilities. So if we have uh, the beat level of 6-8, should be able to be modeled by the beat level of a 2-4 bar. The stress patterns might be similar. Or the subbeat level of a 6 8 might be able to be modeled by the subbeat level of a piece that's in 9 or 12. They're all compound meters. One thing we want to also do in the future is we want to work on live performance data. Right? So, what I've shown you so far has to be from quantized data, it has to be from beat aligned data, and these are tempos of the song throughout the live performance. You can see it's almost never constant. So 
in order to do work on live performance, we need some sort of beat tracking algorithm to sort of plug on top of it. And that will be the next step. And then after we finish with the metrical analysis, what else do we want to plug into our language model? And that is harmonic analysis. So key signature detection, that's one thing that gives the uh, transcription system an idea of what notes to expect. I think that is already built into a couple of transcription systems. Um, a bit more complicated, shown here, uh, work with Mark grenoff wilding and Mark Steedman, uh, is chord progression analysis. This is using uh, a grammar CCG, uh, with the idea that even more than just the key signature, if we have some idea of where we are within the melody, within the harmony, within the chord progressions, we'll know what notes to expect in the future harmonically. And then, of course, the big step, right, is applying it to existing note detection algorithms, applying it to existing transcription systems. And that's really not that trivial of a problem, but it is definitely the goal of this project. So, in conclusion, can we teach computers to understand music, not philosophically? Can we give computers an idea of what to expect of music based on what it's heard of the song so far? And I hope I've shown that we can. My thought is that with symbolic music analysis, we can do that. And if we apply that to music transcription, just like they do in speech transcription, we're using language models, that we can improve music transcription performance greatly. So thank you for listening. I'd like to thank Mark Steedman, my collaborator on the voice separation work, and my advisor, and any questions. The HMM, um, yes. For voice correction. Yeah. I'm wondering if the uh, polyphony is unconstrained. Isn't your state space huge? It's infinite. Yeah. How do you cope with that? Yeah. Uh, and another thing is that we don't have probabilities for the length of the following note, so the offset is infinite, right? Um, so the way we cope with that, we don't constrain that the probabilities are sum to one, which is a bit of a it's a, yeah, it's interesting, but um, we use Gaussians to model this, so instead of like just assigning buckets and everything, we just use a probability distribution, and this gives us a smooth, continuous uh, probability space. So we do a bit of, we use like a modified Viterbi algorithm, which is the standard HMM, but uh, that I didn't really quite get into that, but yeah, that's one of the, <laughs> Interesting bits. Yeah. So I uh, just check. I understood the, the final bit. The, you were training on just the inventions and testing on the inventions and training yes. on just the views and training on the views. Yes. Did you try and try to create some sort of prior by mixing up all of your data? Yes. And then testing on the inventions to see if that would boost right. performance. Um, I did. And it didn't boost performance. Okay. So the issue there is that the fugues get quite complicated right. and get quite syncopated, especially towards the end, uh, at least after you hear the first subject in the answer. So you didn't see um, any more case 6 8 No. So, so what happens is in the inventions, um, these are quite simple pieces. So you saw most of them are in 4 4. Yeah. Um, so when we train it on the fugues, the model expects some syncopation to happen, mm -hmm. which doesn't always happen in the fugues. So it ends up allowing some strange type signatures right. because they see syncopation in the future. Yeah. Um, one thing that might be interesting is to maybe just train on the fugue subjects because those are, tend to be a bit simpler. There doesn't tend to be as much syncopation. Uh, and then apply that to the inventions, or trying to get more songs from both styles. Uh, and again, this, hopefully this backing off idea would help with that as well, just a, a way to get more data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about your metrical model, because it seems like 
uh, your assumption of what the model is is entirely based, and correct me if I'm wrong, on the assumption that uh, stronger notes will be longer notes. Yes. Yeah. So that's only one of the important factors yeah. in the magical literature uh, on acuity rhythm. There's so many other ones. Yeah. Um, and like immediately when you get into syncopation, that's going to fall apart. Right. Um, so I was wondering if you consider taking a look at any of the other possible factors, like yeah. the fact that um, the notes that are stronger tend to be like more of the, the dominant and um, yeah. tonic notes yeah. in the melodies, um, so, mm -hmm. that they tend to be louder. Yeah, so, so uh, the good thing is since we're working from MIDI data, we have the velocity of the notes, which is the loudness. We have the pitches of the notes. And these are also two very important factors. So like you mentioned, if you have the harmonic analysis, if you see a tonic or a dominant, this might be on the beat. If you see some accidentals that fall outside of the key signature, this is likely to be off of the beat. Uh, if you hear very low notes, these tend to be on the beat. Um, so there's lots of further ideas. Uh, the goal of this work was to sort of see how far we could get using just duration. Um, because in most of the fugues, uh, humans can do this quite trivially, actually, uh, at least to train people. Um, so we wanted to see if we can get a model sort of as good as possible using just rhythmic and metrical ideas. Uh, but certainly, when we move into more harmonic analysis and key signature and things like that, you know, all of that will help then back in with the metrical structure analysis. And that's one of the uh, good things if we're modeling all of this jointly, is that we get all of this information. So, like I mentioned, with the voice separation, right, there was that one voice that was just 16 notes. And then our HMM thought, oh, wait, wait, we should switch to quarter notes now, in the middle of a bar, in the middle of actually a beat, which is somewhat unlikely. So if we model that then jointly with the um, with the metrical analysis, that can sort of help improve the voice transcription. That can say, wait, 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 wait. What if we sort of kept these 16th notes all together and you start a new voice with the quarter notes? So these are all things that I want to sort of tie together into a big final model. Yeah. Um, so okay. 